Hello, you're listening to DNA Today or watching if you're on YouTube. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I am also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. So on this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics. Today, we have someone from KGI. She is the program director for the Masters of Science in their human genetics and genomic data analytics program. Her name is Dr. Barbara Fortini. So again, she's from the KGI Institute, or sorry, Craig. Uh, Keck Graduate Institute. She also teaches their Masters of Science for genetic counseling students. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So we're going to be diving into talking about career options outside of genetic counseling, which is maybe a shock for some people because we talk about genetic counseling so much on the show, we need to widen the scope a little bit. So we're going to be focusing on genomic data analytics. So can you give us a sense of what this field is for people that have never heard of this before? Sure. Um, And I hope no one's ever heard of it before because we just kind of had to make up a name a few years ago when we went to start this program. Um, So genetic counseling is a very visible patient-facing side of the genetics uh, medical um, system. But between when um, a genetic counselor gets a test result and goes to tell a patient what it means and what it means for their family, there are a lot of people that help generate that result from the companies who are designing the genetic tests and deciding what genes go on what panels um, to the actual uh, scientists who are interpreting results to write a report that puts that all into perspective. And even farther back to the researchers who are discovering the gene disease connections that then we can use to help um, support our patients. And so from all of those levels, from the basic science of what's going on to the practical matter of getting results that can be delivered to a patient, there are scientists working at every step of that process. So there's so much in genetics, I think, as we were talking a little bit before we started recording here that, you know, people are probably familiar with genetic counselors if they've listened to this show before or if they're tuning in now um they've probably heard of people you know working on the bench so wet lab and actually being like a researcher and hearing about you know doctors and nurses but there's this whole other side of genetics that you're talking about of figuring out all of the testing and figuring out you know what is as you said included on panels if we find a genetic change what does that change mean and coming up with all this information and So one of the buzzwords around this and even outside of healthcare is big data. So can you break down what big data is and, you know, for focusing on the genetic (laughs) side? Well, I think big data means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, I think there are two main um, aspects of big data in genetics. The first is the big data on a person scale. So for any person, we can look at their whole genome sequence. So that's the massive amount of instructions that are in every cell. And then you can even add on top of that, like testing results, MRI results, um, phenotypes. And so trying to integrate that into a picture of what's going on inside a person involves a lot of data manipulation. On the other side, we have the population scale. We have whole genome sequencing, for um, the population, which we're trying to do with the All of Us program. Um, But we also have genotyping data, which is just looking at a selection of places in the genome. So we can do that a lot easier. So we've done it on a lot more people. And then using that to understand the population, not what makes one person sick, but what makes some people sick versus others. Um, And so both of those scales use genetic data in different ways. And I think the one thing that really brings together the buzzword of big data is just the fact that you cannot analyze it by hand. There's not one person sitting there looking at a gel and saying like, okay, this is what's going on. You have to use bioinformatics tools. You have to even maybe use um, AI to help see things that human pattern recognition can't see. And so it's using the tools to understand the data um, in a way that kind of transcends what we used to be able to do by just looking at, you know, maybe sequencing one gene or even doing just like restriction fragment polymorphisms, you know, that you could interpret on a scale of a researcher looking at one piece of data. These days we have just huge data um, files. Um, Some of them we can't even open on a standard computer, but we try to use all that information to distill that down to something actionable for a patient. And this is impacting so many areas of healthcare. I mean, we could spend the whole time just listing the different areas. (laughs) What are the 
subfields that are maybe the top few that data analysts are working in within genetics? Yeah, the number one is like clinical decision support. So that is trying to get information from testing, quote, I put testing in quotation marks, that's anything you can order um, from a sample that is approved to find information and then use that to make a better decision for that patient. So a lot of times that's a gene panel or whole exome sequencing, more routinely now whole genome sequencing. And so you wanna interpret that data, find a cause of disease and then make a treatment decision that's better than you would have made if you just used standard diagnostic tools. So that's kind of the first one. And that's the one I think most people know the most about, and it seems the most obvious. Um, the next is in clinical trial design. So now we have all this population data. And so we can use that data to make better healthcare um, not just drugs, but also approaches to disease. So how should we separate diseases into subtypes? Should we treat the same people um, with the same phenotypes with the same drug? Or do we use genotyping to decide what drug to give people? And so from that whole um, drug development industry, there's a lot more genetic data underpinning the decisions that are being made even down to how you design a clinical trial. You don't want to accidentally put a bunch of people with the same genotype into one group and then others into another group. So you actually are discovering a genetic relationship and not a functional relationship. So we know more about the genome. So we have to be more careful when we set up clinical trials. Um, and I think the last one is also um, sort of related and that's assay development. So better tests. So what can we do to make a test that is more accurate but also you know, reasonably cheap because we want to allow accessibility, um, but also gives us the information that we need without having to guess you know, what we should be looking for beforehand. So a lot of people go straight to whole genome sequencing, but then you have a bigger data problem. And you, Huge you know, you data get a problem. Lot <laughs> of, um, you know, incidental findings, you might have to make some decisions that you don't want to make, and so, trying to find that happy medium of what is a good test that helps the patient and is you know scalable for um, the future when we hope that we're all doing a more precision personalized style of medicine and that is another buzzword that i feel like i'm always talking about on the show is like precision medicine and personalized medicine and you know with the pharmacogenomic side that you were talking about, that's such an area that I feel like is going to explode. We're, we're such at the beginning of it, of figuring out, okay, you have a certain, you know, genetic change. Does this make you more susceptible um, for medications of like, this one's going to work better than that one. Um, so certainly like an area that I'm seeing that's becoming more and more relevant. Um, and for all of those areas you mentioned, I mean, it's just exploding in terms of the development and all the jobs that we need there. And pe mm -hmm. not enough people are trained in this so that we are filling those positions with people that can really help us advance those fields. Yeah, I mean, that is the bottleneck right now is trained people. I think everyone sees the potential and we have lots of um, small studies which have shown how um, impactful it can be when you do use personalized precision medicine. Um, we also don't wanna overpromise. There's a lot that we don't know about the genome. So if you look at the Rady Children's study where they did whole genome sequencing on these critically ill newborns, you know, they had the big headline was, I think 60% had a result by using whole genome sequencing, but 40% still didn't. And so we want to uh, make sure that we communicate well to the public what genetics can't do. Um, but at the same time, it's a chicken and the egg problem because we need more data. We need to sequence people um, from all different um, ethnic backgrounds. We need to have richer data sets that link um, phenotype data to the genomics data. And so we're in such the infancy of what this is going to be. And at the same time, the tools are developing really quickly. So we have the ability to make um, great strides very quickly. And so it is being held back by the lack of trained people. I mean, you guys, a lot of genetic counselors, I'm sure are listening and you know how many open jobs there are for every genetic counseling graduate. Well, a lot of those are going into the roles where you do analytics, you're not patient facing. And so the reason why we started the um, genomic data analytics program at KGI was to meet that need. If we have these jobs that don't require a genetic counseling license because you're not patient facing, maybe we should train a lot of people just to do this because we need so many people to back up the system. If every patient, 
let's say every rare disease patient gets whole genome sequencing five years from now. That is millions of people that will need to have whole genome sequencing done. And if it's taking two to three days to analyze with a person, you can just understand how many trained scientists that is going to take to implement. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point that genetic counselors can be in these roles and are in these roles, but that you don't necessarily need that license and certification behind you um, that the genetic counseling programs provide and, you know, taking the boards after that um, to get to that point. And that some people may know before, you know, starting their careers, they're choosing what type of undergrad and graduate program they're doing that, you know, oh, I'm not someone that wants to be patient facing. And this is the area that's really interested that I'm interested in. And then this is really kind of paves the way for a career where you're still very active with, you know, the genetics and the genomics community, but you really get to be more hands-on with the actual data and the genetic side, as opposed to just talking about the topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're really into the mystery and the investigative side of like sitting down with a file and really trying to figure out what's going on in that patient, that's, you know, the role of the interpretive scientist is what you really are interested in. And so, yes, you do not need a genetic counseling uh, license to do this role. There are a lot of people that have gotten into this um, position by having a PhD, but I myself have a PhD. It doesn't teach you any of the things you need to know to be a very interpretation scientist. So we try to distill down what are the true skills that you need to do this job well and to train people to do this job really well. And I think it's such an interesting uh, career choice because you get to work on the medical mysteries and really try to figure out what's going on in each patient. And once you have an answer, sometimes you might not have an answer, but um, you can then move on to the next great interesting case uh, the next day. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's interesting to be able to mold what is on panels and what so many people are getting that, you know, if you're someone that's meeting with a patient or, you know, multiple patients, obviously, but Mm -hmm. you're having an effect directly on that person. But you only have so much time in the day to see Mm -hmm. patients. So if you're working on some of this testing and going through and figuring out, you know, variant curation, as you're talking about, like, what does this variant mean in terms of the person's health? You're having an impact on a lot more people. So more of that population public health level, which is exciting to see, like, how many people you're really able to impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the really um, key role of the Um, genomic scientists that maybe the genetic counselor doesn't have is influencing not just the job of interpreting variants, but the workflows that are used, the kind of data that is used, and to really decide like what should we be looking at um, when we're doing it? Do we need a gene panel? Do we need whole exome sequencing? Really playing a part in the maturation of this whole industry. Um, It really is such a new field of medicine in the scope of everything we do, that there is a lot of growth for really deciding what should be done and um, using new tools and developing new um, software packages that make it um, efficient and accessible for everyone. And one area of this is genome-wide association studies that have been popping up more and more with research. (laughs) Can you give people a sense of like what, as we call GWASs, what a GWAS is and maybe an example using your own research with colorectal cancer? Sure. So GWAS studies are um, actually just very fancy chi-squared tests. So if you go back to your biostats class, it really is just a goodness of fit. So we take a... um, state of disease so you either have colon cancer or you don't have colon cancer and then at every single locus that we test so most of the time we're doing SNPs that have two alleles if we divide everyone into the disease no disease is one of the alleles overrepresented versus randomly um, split between the two groups and so it really is that simple Um, conceptually, we're looking for a statistical association. The problem is we have very big sample sizes. So the last GWAS I was associated with, we had over 100,000 cases and 100,000 controls. And we looked at over 5 million variant locations. So if you think about now your spreadsheet is going to have, you know, millions of columns by hundreds of thousands of rows. I don't even know how you begin to read that. I mean, that is so (laughs) much, that is big data. Like That is big data. So you can't do it on a spreadsheet, right? So you have to do it with software packages. Um, And it gives us a lot of information that is completely agnostic. 
So we did evenly space the uh, SNPs across the genome. And then we had some regions where we had signals in the past. So we put more um, SNPs on the panel there to get uh, a better handle on the signal. But it is a purely statistical association that at these SNPs, there are more in one category than in the other. And um, what my role was in the research group and what I really love doing is in taking this association, trying to figure out why. Some of these um, locations in genome uh, for genomic-wide data in colon cancer totally make sense. They're in the TGF-beta family pathway. So there's a TGF-beta gene nearby. We've known that's been involved in colon cancer for decades. That's helpful because it makes us um, confident that our GWAS is actually working. But the really interesting ones are when you get them in areas where there are no genes that have ever been associated with colon cancer before. And so we worked on one region uh, where there were just three completely unknown genes. Um, so they were C11 ORFs. No one had ever bothered to name them when we started working with them. And it was a blank slate. There was a very strong statistical relationship with this region. We had three completely unknown genes. We got in there and we looked. And of course, what we found through doing a lot of GWAS, especially in cancer, is that the variants are not in exons. They're not changing protein coding genes. They're changing the levels of genes by changing enhancers. So they're in the um, elements that control gene expression. And so we looked at the SNPs that fell into these enhancers, and we saw that it was controlling the expression of these two genes. Um, and they're now named colorectal cancer associated one and colorectal cancer associated two. Um, we still have no idea what these genes do. Like we now are confident, very confident that they're expressed in colon tissues and that they are very relevant, but um, we're still on the very first steps of trying to figure out um, what their role is in the cell. So we're starting with the statistics and moving outwards. You know, when I was trained, this was called fishing, but um, I think it's really interesting to find these unexpected, non-biased um, new surprises on what the genome uh, could tell us because it's amazing to say this, but even now, about a half of our genes, we don't know what they do. We only know what half of them do. So there's still so much information we need to understand about our genome. Yeah. And I just have to say that explanation of GWAS is probably the best I've ever heard. Like that is just so crystal clear that you're taking these two groups, people with the condition, people without the condition, and looking at certain points in the genome, certain locations and seeing, okay, the ones that have the condition, is there a change there? I mean, I'm re-explaining, but like your explanation was amazing. <laughs> best I've heard. And so interesting to hear like with your research, like where you started from and like you found genes that are related, that we're seeing it's related to the development of colon cancer. And, you know, as you said, you don't know exactly how, but even like you found something that's brand new in genetics that we didn't know before. And that the curiosity continues because your research doesn't just end there. And you're like, that was nice. Put a bow on it. <laughs> you're always adding to it. And I think that's the one of the many exciting parts of genetics is we keep finding new things and there's always more to find. Like there's 20,000 genes. So we know, I guess what 10,000 or so do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot more for people to be exploring and, and getting involved in. Yeah. We're not running out of projects anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. the one Job security is good. <laughs> Job security is great. And the tools are just so amazing. I mean, genetics and genomics is moving so fast right now. It's impossible to keep up. Um, but that makes it a fun and exciting field to be a part of, that every month I read about a new technique and you can immediately think, oh, I wish I could use this to ask this question. And we can approach problems we've never approached before. I'm um, like, we've always wanted, you know, to have that Gattaca style like result, right? That we can yes. sequence a genome and then tell you what you're at risk for. So then you can make these health choices that will like make your life better. Well, we can't really do that. Of course, a lot of it has to do with the interaction of the genome and, our, and the environment. But we're now actually starting baby steps to be able to use like polygenic risk scores to say, maybe not that you have a 27.3 chance of getting colorectal cancer, but we could say, you know, from your genome, you're three times more likely than someone who doesn't have these variants to have colon cancer. So perhaps you should start having colonoscopy a little earlier. Um, and we can start to approach this for a lot of diseases that we just tell people, okay, we don't, we can't put a number on it, but we can say that you are at higher risk than the average person. Now, whether people choose to do anything differently is a very different question. And there are some studies that have now looked at behavioral changes after they've been told this data. Um, and I think it always comes down to, you know, how 
what are you trying to ask people to do? Lots of people know that smoking is bad for them, but it's just not easy to say like, okay, well, I'm going to stop smoking. I mean, that's a very complicated um, yeah. question, you know, change to make. Um, but they did find in one study that if they told people that they were at higher risk for melanoma, they wore sunscreen more often. So we have to think of ways we can um, use the data to help influence um, good health behavior choices, but also understand that a lot of health behaviors are not simplistic choices. Yes, and hopefully we'll get to the point of Gattaca. We actually did a whole episode looking back, um, you know, 20 plus years later of like how much of that is actually real today. Um, so for people interested in Gattaca, you should definitely check out that episode. Um, but one question that I think of with all this is, you know, this term like genomic data analytics, like this is a newer area um, for people. How does this compare to say a master's degree in like bioinformatics? What are the differences between the two for people that are like, well, they both sound interesting. Which one should I go for? <laughs> yeah. So the real difference is our, uh, the first part, which is the masters of human genetics and genomic data analytics. So we have a very strong foundation in genetics. And I think that's the real um, asset that our students bring that other um, degree programs don't is that if you're in the GDA program, you're gonna take all the same genetics classes as a genetic counseling student. So you'll take human molecular genetics, you'll take human genomics, you'll take medical genetics. So you really understand what the data means and why it's going to be used. Then we add on the programming um, in both Python and in R and transcriptomics and the hands-on bioinformatics manipulation to make kind of a super user but we don't have time to really go into full-blown computer science. So the students who graduate from GDA, they might lean more towards bioinformatics, especially if they came in with a strong computer science background. But it's to make someone who understands both how to use the tools really well and what the data really means. So you can kind of bring together those two um, aspects to do something that neither experts in neither field can do. Um, we worked with a very talented bioinformaticist in our research group when I did my postdoc, but he didn't know any genetics, right? So he could manipulate what a, a data wild set thought. Like to me, that's in, like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He could do stuff in five minutes, which would take me hours and hours and hours. But at the same time, he couldn't um, look at the data and make any new, you know, under, they couldn't bring it into a new form of understanding because that was not his training. He was a computer scientist who worked with um, biology data sets. Then at the other hand, we have lots of people who know a lot of genetics, but they're scared of the coding. And so our students are really the people who can sit in a room with both, understand the problem, understand how you get to the solution. Even if they're not going to be the, the person that writes the program that solves the problem, they can talk to the people doing the coding. And you can also run um, tools command line and try things out. So some of our students in their capstones, they're building new pipelines by taking uh, lots of different pieces of software that have been written by others and putting them together in a new way. And so that's a skill that you don't really get unless you really understand what, where you need to take the data from and to to make a new interesting discovery. So it's such an interesting like marriage of like genetics and you've got the science and looking at all of like the ways that you can be using the software and understanding and really being able to interpret it so that you're part of the team. So for people that are listening and they're like, wow, this sounds like a career I want to do. I'm destined for this or I'm interested. I want to learn more. Um, what are the prereqs? What do you suggest like advice for people applying to the program, especially at KGI? I mean, how can they make their application stand out? Well, we do have um, our requirements are all on the website, but it's really quite basic. So we need chemistry and biology and some genetics. So we do expect people to come in with undergraduate level genetics knowledge. Um, and then we're going to blow your mind with lots more information extremely quickly when we really deep dive into human genetics and genomics. Um, the other thing is some familiar with computer science and programming is nice, but it's not required. So we do teach our intro to um, programming for people who have zero exposure to Python or any sort of command line. Um, but I do think most students feel a little bit more comfortable if they do some, maybe some free online courses just to kind of understand what it means to be um, working on the command line and programming directly. Um, other than that, just the willingness to learn and to really um, want to understand problems at a deep level. We do a lot of really um, detailed 
deep dives on subjects like chromatin confirmation. Because if you really want to understand what's going on when you have a structural variant, you have to understand how the genome like interacts and folds and talks to itself. Um, and so these are a lot of very technical kind of aspects of genetics that we really want the students to understand before they understand how it's represented in data and how it's represented um, in test results. Um, and so if you're interested, definitely um, look into what uh, the sort of the greatest hits in genetics and genomics right now. Um, for our personal statements, we do ask you to talk about the um, uh, discovery or development since the Human Genome Project that gets you most excited. And when we're reading applications, we really want to see um, the applicant shine through. We really want to see why you are interested in this. Not why you think we should be interested in you, but why really you're passionate about genetics and genomics, what's exciting, what you want to learn more about, and um, really that spirit of adventure to go on this journey because genomics is changing from the time you submit your application to the time you graduate, there will be things discovered that will, you know, change what you're going to do in your career, and we can't predict what they're going to be. Yeah, wow. You, you make me want to go back to school. <laughs> I'm like, and I, I just graduated, but I'm like, you know, I, I miss being able to like sit and learn all of this and just be so hands on and, and also be with other students that are so interested in genetics. I think that's such a great aspect of any kind of genetic program that, you know, that camaraderie with classmates and figuring out these concepts together. Um, for people that have graduated from the program, what are some places that they have been employed? What are like their actual job titles? Yeah, so we have uh, seven graduates. Uh, the uh, biggest chunk are now variant interpretation scientists. So they have a few different titles, but they're um, doing the same job. Uh, so a couple of them work for hospital systems. So there are kind of two ways to get into variant interpretation right now. There are still big hospitals that do everything in-house. So a patient will come in, they'll be identified as a candidate for sequencing. It will be sequenced at that core lab at the hospital and they interpret it there. Um, and so these roles are very um, interesting for students who like to see the whole arc of a patient because you're going to be at the hospital. So you're likely to know the doctor that orders the test, the genetic counselor that gives the results. So you can be part of that continuity of care. And we have some students doing that. Um, we also have some students that work for um, testing companies doing the same thing. So um, if you're really interested in having a different kind of test, you know, on your desk every day, it's a really good choice to work for one of the companies because, you know, whoever is contracted with that company to send in samples is going to choose the panel. And whether you specialize in one panel or you specialize in one disease group, um, you'll be getting samples from all over the country every day. So we have some students who work in that. We also have one student who chose to go to medical school. And I think this is great because we need a lot more doctors who understand what genetics and genetics yes, is, please. <laughs> what it can do, what it can't do, all of that. And so um, we're very encouraging of students who want to use this as a stepping stone to um, perhaps set up a great um, precision medicine practice in the future. Um, and then we have uh, one student who has gone to the um, technology side, so working for a company that is um, inventing new um, technologies for sequencing. And so he's using that understanding of where the data goes to help you know, make better tools that are easier to use. All such interesting jobs, and I'm sure it's going to change so much over the years too, but this program, I mean, it sounds like it really provides such a skill base and it's not just you're learning concepts, you're really able to like use your naming actual programs that you're using and everything. So if people are curious and want to learn more, they can head over to kgi.edu. We're going to have that link also in the show notes for this episode uh, available at dnapodcast.com. And you guys can interact with us on social media. Just search DNA today. You can also search KGI and we're going to include all their social media again on the website. Um, so if you have questions for us, you can send them into info at dnapodcast.com. Dot com. I'll be sure to forward them along if, if they uh, go to you. So, um, And if people can rate and review us on Apple, that would be fantastic. So thank you so much, Dr. Fortini, for coming on and just sharing all your insight and just passion. It's just, it's coming through the screen. So everybody should be watching this on YouTube. But I have to say, you're so passionate about this. Um, and I've just heard great things about the program. So thank you so much for coming on and just sharing this and enlightening people that it's not just genetic counseling. There's a lot of careers in genetics out there. All right, yes, thank you so much for having me.